Oh, hi there. Um, I'm Black Bright and I'm broadcasting out of the UK and I'm talking on a various of topics that I think may be of interest or that people ask me to do or what I respond to or what I react to. And this morning, you know, after doing a video about are women to blame, I started thinking about the black men and I started thinking to myself, who's got their back? But I also thought that, you know, black men are made to feel so pow made to look so powerful. And yet so many of them feel powerless. And I was thinking about why is that? Why do they feel powerless? I mean, I, I, I kind of, I can't say how a black man feels, but you know, sometimes when I listen to videos and about the black man's struggle and they're talking about the incarceration and everything's happened to them, you end up feeling, oh, you know, oh, they're, you know, why don't they get some balls kind of thing. But you don't realise, well, you do realise, you know that the system is against them, you know that, you know, they're disproportionately discriminated against and we kind of know that as women but I think what happens is as women we have such high expectations of black men and sometimes we for, well we forget that they're not able to meet those expectations because of the system a lot of times their opportunities have been taken away and you know th rethinking on um, T's letter when he said um, a black man or a black child dies a thousand times and that children are taken away because of law. And you kind of think historically what has been happening. We know that they've been castrated. We know they've been lynched. We know that they've been subjected. You know, their, their predecessors have been subjected to cruelty and torment and torture. Their women have been taken away and raped in front of them. So they do feel demoralised and they do feel embarrassed and hate their history. So a lot of them try to get away from their history and, and away from themselves and they date outside their race, even though it's not a conscious thing. And that is what has happened. Now, when I kind of um, think about black men today, you know, I kind of, you know, you look at them and yes i was trying to think to myself they do look powerful a lot of them are going to the gym a lot of them are looking buff a lot of them can dress nice and then when you get to know them there's no substance in a lot of them and what happens is is that the woman kind of feels um not betrayed but deceived because what they see on the surface is not who that person is underneath. And in that moment, she's not really thinking, why is that? She's kind of thinking, oh, that person is not who I thought he was. Now, I think what is happening is that a lot of men are I think black men do love their black women, even those who date outside their race. They're angry because they don't feel protected by them. They don't feel supported by them. They don't feel understood by them. And because of that, they get angry. And in a sense, they're getting at the white man and saying, look, you know, I can do this. And they're getting at the black woman because that is all they can. That is their armor. That is their artillery to do that. That's one thing that they have the power to do. So when you think about the situation of the majority of black men who are disproportionately discriminated against, uh, the opportunities are taken away. When you think about black men as well, is that their thing was their hustle. You know, that's what they're creating. They're creative at hustling. And even the woman's hustle is being taken away. You know, women who used to stay at home and braid, you know, they're trying to take that away. Any little hustle that they feel that that 
um, can liberate the black man is quashed by laws, re legislation and or victimization or it's discriminated against in some shape or form. So all of those ways that a man could hustle and make a living and provide for his woman and his family, he's not able to do that. And if they don't have the wherewithal to do other things, then you know, they're kind of left on the back burner. And I think that is where the black woman has higher expectations. They're kind of saying to them in, indirectly, you know, like when a mother chastises their child and then they chastise them because they want to do better. I think it's a bit of the same thing. Yes, the system is against you. Yes, the police are against you. Well, the, system, the police are a part of the system. But you can get up and do something. Sometimes women see things in men that men don't see in themselves. And But sometimes, and also you have men who are arrogant and who don't want to listen or who don't want to do that who or who are so demotivated and demoralized, they don't even want to try. You know, like the other day I was saying, what is your talent? You know, can you do gardening? You can go out there and I mean, it is so difficult nowadays because you can't cold call. You can't go around and put your car through the door. You know, people are so skeptical and fearful. So whereas you could knock on people's door and say, can I do your garden for you? That's been stopped. You can't do that. Can I do your windows? The people when they because of the images they paint of black people, you know, they're afraid to give a black person that job. And unless it's done um, through recommendation or some other way, it's very, very difficult. So every little way is kind of being blocked. And it's a process that's been happening over time where black men are blocked every step they turn. Even if they're trying to do something legally, there's a block or a cap on what they can do. And so, yes, we have black men who look powerful, who look beautiful. And when you have them in your space, they come over as weak and um, powerless, in fact. And a lot of them do feel they actually feel powerless, a lot of black men, because what they cannot fight the system. How do they fight the system? So um, what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, um, one of the other things that T was talking about was about um, it, he was talking about it's a process and how women have um, are complicit in the game and how the law has taken away um, the children. And you also have those um, men who have to, because of behavior or reaction or whatever, they're unable to see their children, but they still have to pay for them. So they're the distant breadwinners, as he called them, you know, and that cannot make a man feel good to know that he's got a fork out. The woman is probably with another man, another man who's looking after his children, and yet he still has to pay because of the law. And if he doesn't pay, especially in America, that is uh, that, you know, you can actually be deported for not paying um, child maintenance. But, you know, going back to the law and the women being complicit in the law is that, you know, I was talking about the time when women had children and they used to have children to get a, a, a council flat. But also what that meant was mothers did not put the children's past um, surname or did not put the father on the birth certificate. So as a result, the father had no legacy because the child has the mother's surname. I mean, I, I lost out big time because of that. My mother never put, my, even though my mother didn't, ha well, it's different times, different strokes for different folks, but my mother never put my father's name, my biological father's name on my birth certificate. So, and that, she might have thought, well, that was the right thing to do back then.
for whatever reason. But I suffered. Well, I didn't suffer. Well, I did indirectly suffer because of that. Because when I went to Jamaica and I wanted to get um, a dual passport or dual nationality based on my biological father I had all his information because I I met up with him and I spent time with him before he died because she hadn't given me his surname he 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 died without leaving um anything to me well he, what he said is that since I didn't have his surname he didn't want he wasn't I, as far as he was concerned even though he knew I was my his child and he treated me as his child there was no um, he didn't have no um, loyalty to me. Well, words to that effect anyway. But my point is, is that I had my details of my father. I had all my details of my mother. But because my father wasn't on my birth certificate, I couldn't claim him as being my father. And my stepfather's details, even though I had some of them, I don't know his grandmother and all those kind of details. So I paid out a lot of money and I didn't get the passport because I didn't have enough information. So when you deny or when mothers deny um, fathers, I mean, you're more or less taking away the birthright of the child. And when mother, mothers deny um, their children, of their father's name it it, it has long-term implications and they might not think of it then but it does so a child grows up with his mother's name and you know even when you think about um, that child growing up and meeting someone else how do they know if they don't know who their father is or they don't have their father's name and they meet somebody with the same name that they're not related and, you know, the parents don't think ahead. They're thinking in the moment. And I know it's not a calculated risk. It is designed to be survival. And a lot of it was about survival. But, you know, in, you know, we underestimate how calculating the system and the government is. I mean, they were way ahead of us when they planned the segregation and the breakdown of the families and all of that, they were way ahead of us. So we just come in like little puppets. We Yes, we have um, played the game, so to speak, but it was, we were oblivious. And a lot of us, we were not conscious. And we, you know, you're not kind of thinking that the um, system is working against you. You know, you're young people, you're children almost. But what happens is as adults, you realise the implications and then it's too late. It's too far gone. But is it too late? Is it too late to turn things around? I don't know. I think if each of us tell our story to our children so they can understand what's going on. Young people, they don't know what's going on. You know, my dad's left and my mum my ain't got my, you know, I haven't got my dad's name. I don't know who my dad is. My dad don't come to see me. They don't know the struggle. They don't know the history. They don't know that historically, you know, the system has been against the black family, has been hell bent on breaking it up. And if there's no one to tell their stories, in my day, my mother is so proud and, you know, they want to maintain that respect. She hid a lot from me. And by hiding a lot from me, I made a lot of mistakes. If she had come up front and said, look, this is how this was. This is what I experienced. This is what the time, this is what it was like at the time. I felt I had to make these life choices and these decisions. And if parents told their children the truth, you know, I, you know, I was talking to a, a, a young lady the other day and she was saying her mother wouldn't tell her who her father was. Her father was, she said, oh, oh she went, she slept with about two or three men on a drunken night. She doesn't know who the father is. Well, tell her the names of the three bloody men. Let her find out. Let her get the DNA. Let her go and search that kind of information. Give her an opportunity to fulfill her identity and make herself whole. 
We've got a lot of broken children and they're all desperately walking this earth, making mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes. There's no solidarity. It's fragmented and it's fragmented because parents are not telling their story. They're ashamed of their story and we cannot be ashamed of our stories. We cannot be ashamed of them because we made decisions at that time because of a reason. And we explain that reason to our children. Children, yes, we want our children to respect us and look up to us. We do. And I don't believe that they'll look down on us just because we're telling them the truth. When my mother eventually told me the truth, you know, in my big old age now, you know, it didn't make me think less of my mother. It just made me understand what she went through. If anything, I could understand why she made those decisions she made. It didn't make it any better, but I understood and I could empathise with her situation. So we need to talk to our children and tell them our truths, tell them our stories, how, no matter how difficult it is, because otherwise we're going to raise generations and generations of powerless people and powerless black men. So that's all I've got to say. I hope it makes a little bit of sense. Um, yeah, we don't want our... Um, neither male or female. We don't want them having a sense of failure. That's not what we want. And as black women, we don't, we're not calling our black men failures. When they don't provide for us, we're not calling them failures. But what we're trying to do is tell them our expectations, the expectations we want them to meet in order so that they can be um, more motivated to do that, not demotivated and thinking, oh, the system is against me because we were all born with something we can sell. I'm not talking about bodies now, but we were all born with something we can sell. We all have talents. And if you can just be creative and think, what am I good at? What do people say I'm good at? And sell it. Whichever way, look at people, like I've said on another video, people cooking on YouTube. You know, some of them are making mega bucks. People are doing all kind of foolishness on YouTube and making mega bucks. But on YouTube isn't the answer all the time. You know, you can, you know, you might not be a person who likes to speak into a, into a camera, into a void. That might not be your thing. I know I used to. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm actually doing these videos, to be honest. I used to look at myself and I used to criticise everything about myself. Everything. I didn't like the way I look. I didn't like the way this looked. I didn't like that. I didn't like my voice. I, you know, I didn't like what I said. I chastised myself when I made a mistake. If I swallowed or if I slipped up, I would be criticising myself. I was giving myself a hard time. But, you know, something told me that there is something in my life experiences that can help other people. And I probably haven't even got there yet. But I do believe if I keep doing the videos, something's going to click. The penny is going to drop. And I am going to be providing a service that's going to help black people get on their feet and get their act together. But I don't know I don't know what that is. That's probably why I dabble in a lot of different subjects and do a lot of different things, because I know every black person needs help in a different area. We all need help in different areas. So I kind of put my foot, you know, feel the water here, feel the water there, see what responses I get and see how what we can do to kind of put ourselves on a stronger footing. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for following me. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing. Continue to share. Continue to get your friends to subscribe. And yeah, and that's all for now. Bye-bye.